Welcome to the third lecture in our series on healthcare communication. Uh, we're going to be starting off today by discussing self-disclosure. In the last lecture, we touched on the Johari window um, with impression management, showing what you and uh, what you do and do not see about yourself, and what you allow others to see or not see, as well as the continuum between personal and professional self-disclosure and what is appropriate and inappropriate. Self-disclosure is essentially the choices we make to reveal or conceal information about ourselves. Um, and today we're going to discuss some benefits as well as some risks to self-disclosure. One of the forms of self-disclosure you're probably more personally familiar with is catharsis, um, that feeling of needing to get something off your chest and sharing it with others, um, either because you might be hiding something from someone and you don't want to hide it anymore, or perhaps you have a feeling inside that you just need to get out, put into words. Now, if you remember that continuum, catharsis would definitely fall within the more personal self-disclosure. And if made to a patient, it's likely going to be more inappropriate as well. Um, in the professional setting, though, reciprocity is very common for self-disclosure. If I have a patient that is having difficulty managing their stress but might not want to come to terms with that, I might decide to share that I have difficulty managing my own stress. Um, and while that is more on the personal side than the professional side, it's with the ultimate goal of creating a safe space for the patient to feel more comfortable revealing information about themselves. You might self-disclose to clarify, which actually ties in with one of the listening strategies that we discussed last week. For example, a patient is sharing something and you disclose something uh, in return in order to make them feel like you understand uh, what they're going through. Again, on the more personal side, we have self-disclosure for validation or reassurance. Um, perhaps you did something and you want some feedback on it, so you're going to disclose that thing that you did, whether it was good, bad, um, or maybe you just want an evaluation of how you did on something. Now, if you remember back to the Johari window, that column of what you know um, and what you decide to reveal to others versus decide not would fall into this identity management um, concept in self-disclosure. The things that you choose to reveal in order to create a, an impression about yourself as perhaps an open healthcare professional who's qualified and ready to listen to the patient's concerns. We self-disclose in our relationships. Um, to a partner, you will likely want to be self-disclosing that you have feelings for them. That's something that makes uh, your partner feel good, and then when they self-disclose in return through reciprocity, um, you feel better about the relationship as well. And finally, there's self-disclosure for social influence, um, which can help gain or exert more control over a situation. And it's not uncommon for someone to reveal something about themselves in order to take a more prominent leadership role in, in an informal situation. Um, for example, I spend a lot of time in the mountains and I have come across many different injured parties and one of the first things I disclose is that I'm a nurse and that is something where they're more willing to listen to what I have to say in order to try to help them than they would if I was just a random stranger. Now, as mentioned before, you might be using self-disclosure in your personal life. In fact, you are um, using self-disclosure in your personal life. So with your friends would be a good example to strengthen your friendships, um, with your partner to strengthen your relationship. Um, you also use self-disclosure in the professional world. You're probably much more careful about what you're disclosing in, for example, a job interview. You might self-disclose to clarify, um, sort out confusion, and self-disclosure is often the way that we break the ice with strangers. You tell them a little bit about yourself, you ask a little bit about them, they tell you a little bit about themselves, and so on, until you know each other a little bit better and can start building from your common ground. But self-disclosure also comes with risks. Um, in the clinical setting, you need to be very cautious about self-disclosure, as I said in the last lecture, to make sure that it's for the patient's benefit rather than just for your own. Sometimes self-disclosure can come with a hidden agenda and there can be repercussions if the other person realizes that you have a hidden agenda. Um, this is something that applies just as well in your personal life as it will in your professional life. If someone realizes that you're hiding things um, and not self-disclosing different things in order to create a more positive profession in the workplace, uh, that might negatively impact their view of you. You might face rejection if you uh, disclose a romantic interest in a friend, they might reject that and say that 
they just want to be friends or maybe even they don't want to see you for a little while and then just want to be friends. Um, it can also create a negative impression of yourself disclosing the wrong things. I very briefly saw a therapist who would not stop self-disclosing all of her own personal problems. Um, and that showed me that she was more interested in talking about her own problems with me than she was about working through mine. Um, so that's an example of personal inappropriate self-disclosure in the professional environment that can hamper or uh, destroy your relationship with a patient. You might lose influence if you reveal that you don't have power over something. Um, you might cause uh, some damage to a relationship if you reveal some feelings that the other person doesn't appreciate. And you can even hurt somebody by disclosing your opinion in an inappropriate way um, or when it's not solicited. The next resource on the Canvas site is how to detect cultural differences. And we're actually going to skip over that and return to it at the end of this lecture. So we'll be moving on to the difference between culture and personality. Um, culture is something that tends to be defined by external factors, whereas personality define, is often defined by internal factors. A fantastic definition um, or explanation of culture that I've read is that it is the non-physical inherited traits that we have at birth um, or gain throughout our lives. These are things such as the environment around us, the socioeconomic group we belong to, the language we speak, and some of our most basic assumptions about the world around us. And as in the last lecture, uh, we talked about personality having many different definitions and ways to look at it. But imagine personality as who you are inside yourself. Um, it is your chosen values, your thoughts, your feelings, your beliefs, your personal assumptions about the world around you. A lot of this personality can be shaped by the world around you, but ultimately you are the one who controls the way your personality develops. The resource uses words like reserved, shy, assertive, loud, uh, rude, and gentle. And I would, I would really go as far to say as those aren't great descriptors of personality. Those are more descriptions of someone's temperament. Personality would be better described by whether or not someone is extroverted or introverted. Uh, which is loosely defined as, do you get energy from spending time with other people or do you like to have some time to yourself to recharge? Um, things like sensing versus having intuition. Um, do you take more input from what's in your own head or more input from the world around you? Um, are you more of a rationalizer, a thinker, or a feeler? Um, do you go by emotions a little bit more than by your thoughts themselves? And then, do you tend to judge or do you tend to perceive? Um, are you comparing different things or are you just trying to look into the depth of different things? Judgers tend to be organized and prepare, prepared, while perceivers like to keep their options open. Um, they're more open-minded and are more likely to act spontaneously. As discussed in the previous lecture, there's a big debate over how much influence nature has versus nurture. Um, but I would argue that your personality is shaped by both, but a direct product of neither. If you remember back to Kohlberg's stages of moral development, um, the final stages of creating abstract ideas to guide you through moral principles um, would be a much more direct representation of a personality. Um, you can also recall me mentioning Viktor Frankl and Kazimierz Dabrowski and both of them uh, pioneered a lot of work in personality, personality development, especially Dabrowski. And in their views, personality is truly centered around the choices that you make as a person. Um, you often hear the, time, the phrase, someone is finding themselves, um, which implies that they're trying to discover who they are. But both of these uh, psychologists would argue that the self is not discovered, the self is created. Um, you might find your own circumstances, but you need to create your answer to the world around you. And I hope I mentioned, but I'm pretty sure I forgot to, um, that Kohlberg, as well as the other uh, psychologists mentioned in the previous lecture, will have a very Eurocentric view of the world. Um, they're Europeans, they're all white men, um, and their views on the world reflect that. And that's true for everyone's opinions. You know, with Freud, um, he was obsessed with sex, so he saw everything through the lens of sex. Um, 
So everything that every psychologist, every theorist, every scientist, every one of us sees comes through the own bias or lens of our personal experiences, our backgrounds, our assumptions about the world. I'm pretty sure I've already mentioned a couple of movies in my lectures. If you can't tell, I do love movies. Um, but The Matrix is a fantastic series that addresses a little bit of this uh, question of how much does our perception about the world shape our beliefs, our opinions. And one of the biggest themes of the movie is escaping this lens of bias that we all have through the use of other perspectives and trying to integrate those other perspectives in order to have a more holistic view on the world. Um, the most recent Matrix movie was fantastic, but I'm not going to go off on that tangent. Instead, I will read the quote at the bottom of your resource, which I think is a fantastic pairing for this, that he or she who does not know themselves does not know others. So it may be said with equal truth that they who do not know themselves, I'm sorry, they who do not know others know themselves very imperfectly. Um, and this is to say that you need to have self-knowledge before you can start to understand the world around you, that you must look within before you start to look outside. But that if you do not look outside at all, it will also be very hard to look within, that it is a balance between the two, um, but that much work has to be put in to understanding who you are before you can really go evaluating the world around you. So next we're going to be discussing how anxiety impacts communication. And I'll start by defining anxiety as a feeling of apprehension or unease, um, of overexcitement that is disproportionate to the situation you're in. So imagine you're standing next to a cliff, it's very normal to feel apprehensive. Um, but if you're simply sitting in a classroom and you're feeling that same level of apprehension, um, unless you've got your final sitting in front of you and you haven't studied for it, that would be a situation where you're experiencing anxiety, where your feeling of unease is not consistent with the situation that you are in. And this can have a major impact on your communication with other people. Um, a lot of the feeling of anxiety comes from what we call cognitive distortions. And this is where I'm going to diverge from the resource a little bit, and I'm going to put up my own resource. Um, and I will try to remember to attach that in the Canvas site as well, because I think this is very useful. We've talked about how much of a process it can be to carry on a conversation and how much energy it can take. Um, so there are a whole bunch of different factors that can influence your own personal thinking that tend to increase your levels of anxiety and make it more difficult to participate actively in conversations. So it is normal for you to experience some or all of these to some degree, um, but when they begin to cause apprehension, um, anxiety, that really makes it difficult for you to function normally in your life. Um, when they start to impact your everyday life, um, that's a time where you should go and seek out more professional help to deal with them. So as I go through, um, I want you to just keep a little bit of a mental track of, you know, which ones do you experience more, which ones do you experience less. And one of the best ways to fight cognitive distortions is simply to be able to recognize them, recognize them as irrational thoughts, um, label them as irrational thoughts, and then try and think your way through to a more rational perspective. This is a foundational approach of cognitive behavioral therapy, also known as CBT. So the first one we have is magnification and minimization. Um, that's exaggerating the importance uh, of generally negative things and minimizing the importance of positive things. Um, this is one that I'm certainly guilty of. And one form of this is catastroph I'm sorry, catastrophizing, um, which is seeing only the worst possible outcome in a situation. And this is one where I like to joke that I went to school for catastrophizing. Um, because as a nurse, a lot of the times what you're doing is you're thinking of what's the worst thing that can happen to the patient, what's the biggest risk that I can limit right now. Um, and it can be very difficult if you have that train of thought for 40 hours a week to then just snap out of it the other times. Um, so it requires an important balance so you don't get stuck in this uh, cognitive distortion where it will eventually prevent your ability to actually do what you wanted to do in the first place, which is prevent those bad things. Next we have overgeneralizing. Um, that's taking one situation and seeing it as, you know, your total view of your person. Um, 
you were a little awkward in a conversation, it's not just because that conversation was awkward, it's because you were awkward. Um, that's a very easy one to fall into, and it helps to try and remember a little bit further back. Um, we all have different situations that negatively impact us or bother us, um, but try and take your view a little bit further back than just that one situation and look at how you feel about yourself overall, that that one situation doesn't color who you are. Uh, there's also magical thinking, which is believing that things that are completely unrelated to cause and effect in this world will actually impact cause and effect. Um, so being a good person means that only good things will happen to you. And as much as that would be nice, it's simply not the case. Um, personalization is taking responsibility for things outside of your control, um, commonly referred to as carrying the world on your shoulders. We can't control everything. We can only control our own actions um, and hope that those exert a positive influence around us. Um, but if things go bad, we can't just start blaming ourselves. And that's a trap that I fall into quite a bit. Jumping to conclusions is also quite common. Um, and that's when you take a little bit of information and then you jump to your conclusion about it, you are interpreting it with not enough actual information to make an interpretation. Um, and that can be trying to rationalize someone's motives and you're thinking from your own perspective what their motives might be, um, which is not actually their own perspective. So you're trying to read their mind essentially. Um, or fortune telling where you're expecting that something will turn out poorly or maybe turn out well without actual evidence to do so. Emotional reasoning is also very common and that is when you use your emotions to uh, reflect your world view. You feel a certain way, therefore you are a certain way. I feel like a bad nurse, therefore I am a bad nurse. Um, and a lot of the times in order to get there, what you do is disqualify the positive. Um, you magnify the negative um, and you disqualify anything that contradicts your view um, that might be a positive thing. Uh, should statements are also very common um, and this can range from thinking that the world should be a certain way um, to holding yourself accountable for I should have done this, I should have done that. Um, and generally those kinds of should statements just aren't healthy. You either did or you didn't, and there was a reason you did or a reason that you didn't. And if you hold yourself accountable for those reasons, you have more control over your actions in the future. Finally, there's all or nothing thinking, and this is, you know, I always do a good job, I never do a good job. And this is another one that's easy to fall into as a healthcare professional, because lives are on the line. You need to always do a good job. You need to always protect your patient. Um, whereas you can't protect your patient from everything. Remember the personalization. Um, you don't have control over every circumstance. You only have control over your own actions. And how we handle these emotions are influenced by a number of different factors. Um, three basic factors to go into are your personality. People who are extroverted tend to process their emotions a little bit quicker. Um, your culture. Different cultures will have different emotions about the same events, um, and different cultures have different ways of processing their emotions. Some tend to be more public in their processing, such as grieving, while some tend to be more private. Your own life experiences also uh, color the way that you process emotion, whether or not you've gone to therapy, or whether or not you've completed this course and seen these lists of cognitive distortions. These are things that will change your ability to process your emotions if you apply them. And finally, women tend to be a little bit more perceptive with emotions than men, um, but I do want to make a very strong clarification with the resource that was included for the course um, that I do not believe that uh, the quote, gender is the best way to recognize emotions and interpret them is accurate, honestly, in any way. Um, it is an important factor, but it is not a determinant factor, and it's certainly not the most important way to recognize emotions. The most important way to recognize um, and interpret emotions is by looking at the holistic person who's experiencing them, um, which includes their gender, but which includes also many other factors, including their personality, culture, life experiences, their assumptions about the world, etc. So how exactly does anxiety impair our ability to process these emotions or to participate in conversations?
Um, as we discussed in the previous lecture, conversation is an ongoing process. Uh, we used the hurrier model, which is hearing, understanding, remembering, interpreting, um, oh, what was it? Evaluating and responding. Um, this is essentially a simplification of that model. Um, hearing, listening, comprehending, thinking, and responding. You can see it's very, very similar. Um, Next, we have derealization, which is a psychological term that describes a mental state where you feel detached from your surroundings. Um, the things around you might not seem real, or you might feel like you're not real. And a great example that a lot of people uh, can relate to is if you've ever woken up from a very vivid dream, and then you look around you and you're wondering, are you still in that dream or is this the real world? Imagine having that feeling in the middle of a conversation. Not only does that make listening, comprehending, and thinking difficult, but it can even impact your ability to actually hear what someone's saying. The sounds will come into your ears, but you aren't really processing that at all. And finally, if you're more focused on your anxiety, you're going to have trouble listening to what the other person is saying. So if you're feeling this way, what are some good strategies that you can use? Uh, you can tell the other person that you're feeling a little bit anxious, be open. I use this very commonly with my students, uh, my nursing students, when we're in the hospital, they'll be a little bit nervous or anxious around a patient. Um, and I encourage them to be open with their patients about their level of experience, where they are in their education. And this is a form of self-disclosure that can not only put the student at ease, but also the patient, because they feel now more empowered to make decisions of, oh, I don't necessarily want this student starting an IV on me. Or maybe there's someone who doesn't really care about needles and they're excited. They just realize that, oh, you're a little anxious because you don't have tons of practice with this. Um, there are a lot of patients that actually get very excited to share and allow nursing students to practice their skills. If you're having difficulty listening or comprehending, you can ask the person to repeat themselves. Just be honest and say, I'm really sorry, I didn't quite catch that. Um, would you mind repeating what you just said? You can also practice conversations and small talk. Um, socialization is like a muscle, and especially with COVID, that muscle's gotten very weak for a lot of us. So just getting outside, going to the coffee shop, and talking to the person standing in front of you in line helps you get over some of that social anxiety that we develop when we aren't stretching that muscle enough. Um, and finally, the resource tells you to not overthink, and <laughs> that's probably about as useful as telling an angry person not to be mad. Um, it generally just makes them more mad, and so it's much easier said than done. Um, I think employing some of the analysis of what you're thinking with the cognitive distortions is a much better strategy. Um, that's a concrete way to not overthink, is to stop, take a second and breathe, and try and see if your thoughts line up with any of those cognitive distortions. And if they do, try and think through that process to its logical end of, okay, I'm feeling anxious right now. What am I focusing on? Um, well, I feel bad because I made a mistake earlier today. I'm a bad person because I made that mistake. Oh, that's an overgeneralization. I'm not actually a bad person because I made that mistake. I just made a mistake and I can accept that and then move on. Um, even that process is a lot easier said than done. Um, but that gives you some concrete strategy rather than just don't be anxious or don't overthink. So let's dive a little bit more into stress and anxiety. Um, stress is the influence from the environment that is causing you to feel a certain way, that's causing you to not be in your peaceful equilibrium state. Um, the stressor is the specific thing that is causing that. 
And finally, anxiety is an emotional response to this process. Um, fear is a primal emotion, and it's one that's very important. It's the one that causes that fight or flight response. So we uh, can avoid danger when we're out in the wild. But you know, the coolly lit medical building is no longer the wild where you're going to be worrying about seeing a tiger. So now our challenge becomes managing stress in an appropriate way in our lives. Um, we experience stress through what's known as the general adaptation syndrome. And let me pop that slide up. This is a process that describes your body's ability to process stress or to handle stress. Um, the first thing that happens when there is a stressor is you have an alarm reaction. And this is very short term. It can be seconds to minutes, even hours. Um, and this is where your defense mechanisms are active. Um, this is the beginning of the fight or flight stage. This is where blood flow is being concentrated um, away from your digestive system and towards the muscles, towards the brain and the heart. Um, and if you think about when you're really stressed and how it's difficult eating, that's a great example of this process taking place. And next we have the resistance stage. This is where your body has perceived the threat and is trying to adapt to it. Um, it is trying to resist this stressor from impacting you in your life. Um, generally, your vital signs, your energy levels, your hormones return to normal. And if it's confined to a small space in your body, perhaps you have a, an injury on your hand and it hurt. Um, but generally, your entire body will start to go back to homeostasis, even if, you're even if your hand still hurts. Um, if the damage is over a widespread area or is impacting a whole body system, like your cardiovascular system or with anxiety and stress, your nervous system, your brain, um, then these adaptive mechanisms don't work all the way. They fail and then you enter the exhaustion stage. This is where your ability to respond to the stressor is plummeting um, and you are somewhat plummeting with it. Um, and finally, we have hopefully, um, because exhaustion can result in death depending on the situation, um, hopefully we have the recovery, which is a process that is well too often left out that we need to start focusing on. That we all face stressors in our day-to-day -day lives, whether from relationships, work, um, or even driving through traffic. And we need more than just resistant, uh, alarm resistance and exhaustion from it, otherwise we will be perpetually exhausted. What we need to do is put energy specifically into recovery, into taking better care of ourselves, which I'm going to be trying to bring up as much as possible because you all need to take care of yourselves if you want to avoid burnout and have a long career in the healthcare professions. So just as you experience these emotions, your patients will experience them too. Um, fear is a very common emotion for patients to experience while they're hospitalized and just throughout an illness. Um, it can be fear that they're going to die. It can be fear that they're going to have a different lifestyle when their illness has progressed. It can be simply fear of the unknown. Um, it can be fearing loss of control. Um, these fears are normal, but if they are too severe, they may lead to specific anxiety for the patient. And if the anxiety is severe enough, that might be something that we decide to treat. Um, patients may also feel frustrated, especially if they've had a major change in their body because of an illness. Um, they might be frustrated from lack of progress to meet their goal or it taking too long to meet a goal. Um, and oftentimes this can also result in anger. Um, the person is frustrated, the next step after that is anger, and that might be um, directed at someone like a caregiver, even if the person is angry with a situation rather than the caregiver. So it's important to allow patients to express their anger, to listen openly, and a lot of the times that's just what we need, is to be able to express our feelings, get them out, rather than bottle them up. Patients often experience conflict. There may be family conflicts with the decisions for course of treatment. Perhaps a patient doesn't want to be treated for something, but their family wants the biggest treatment or uh, strongest, most severe treatment possible. Um, or even grief. Uh, patients experience grief at the loss of their previous life uh, before a major illness. So 
as a provider, it's your job to do your best to manage stressors in the patient's environment, try and reduce or eliminate them, and bring about peace and tranquility, which makes it easier for them to process these emotions. Um, you should always be explaining procedures and providing um, as much rationale as you can so the patient doesn't have that uh, as strong of a sense of loss of control. Um, and as I just said, you should be allowing them to talk about their fears, concerns, and frustrations. Um, and always do your best to provide them good care. None of these are a magic bullet, but all of them will certainly help your patients in processing their own emotions. So we've discussed pro uh, proxemics in previous lectures, but now we're going to go into more detail about proxemics in cross-cultural communication. So just as language varies with culture, nonverbal communication also varies with culture. Um, you might be fluent in a certain language, but if you've never been exposed to that culture, you're not going to be able to communicate as effectively as someone who understands the nonverbal cues and signals. Proxemics are a very important part of that because in many cultures, proxemics shows the relationship that you have with somebody, um, where you allow them to be, uh, where you allow them to occupy within your personal space, says a lot about your relationship with them. For example, um, in North America, people tend to value privacy, and so they tend to keep people a little bit further away. Strangers um, will not be allowed into the close personal space. You will tend to keep them at a social distance. Whereas in Latin America, there is less of a value on privacy and more of a value on friendliness and close with others, uh, closeness with others. So uh, someone from Latin America will tend to keep people, even perhaps strangers, in their personal space. And their friends, um, even acquaintances, they might allow into their intimate space. The resource on the Canvas site goes into a little bit of, I think, hyperbole or alarmism. Um, I don't think that it's quite appropriate um, to say that someone from an Arab nation could be perceived as homosexual or promiscuous. Um, simply because of their occupation of physical space. That those are opinions that are formed based on um, more holistic assessments of a person, more holistic even judgment of a person. Um, but the space someone occupies does say a lot about who they are. I think it would be much more appropriate to say that someone who's violating those personal space boundaries might quickly be labeled awkward. So there are three fundamental areas that are related to proxemics, um, essentially subtypes. The first is space, and there are three subtypes of space, uh, fixed feature, semi-fixed feature, and informal space. Each one defines the way we organize our environment around ourselves um, to facilitate communication. Fixed feature space is based on the way we organize our activities. What do we do at home versus at work? Um, what do we do in different rooms of our house? You know, we eat in the dining room, we sleep in the bedroom. Um, that's a very good recommendation I can make for your mental health, that eating in the bedroom is generally not something that is a healthy habit. Next, we have semi-fixed featured space, which imagine we're in a fixed space, such as a classroom. The semi-fixed feature space would be the arrangement of the desks in those classrooms. Um, we might arrange them in small groups to facilitate communication between students. Or we, we might organize them into long rows to facilitate uh, focusing on a lecture. Sociopedal spaces are those that bring people together and stimulate conversations, such as those small groups. Well, sociofugal spaces do the opposite. Imagine a large lecture hall um, that has you know, hundreds of different seats, almost like a movie theater. That would be one that's really discouraging inter-student communication and encouraging focusing on a lecture. And finally, informal space um, closely relates to our use of distance. It's the unconscious space that we maintain when we interact. Um, and that ties perfectly into distance, which um, is broken down, I believe we mentioned before, but I'm just going to go into a little bit more detail halls different spaces, halls for spaces. Um, there's the intimate distance, which ranges from close touching to about a foot and a half. Um, and he breaks that up into a close phase and, and a far phase. Um, 
Next is personal space, personal distance, which is about a foot and a half to four feet. Although now with COVID, I would venture to say that six feet is probably going to be considered our normal social distance. Um, there's also a close and a far phase of this distance. Um, essentially, arm's reach defines what is a close personal distance versus a far personal distance. Um, next, we have social distance, which again is broken down into a close and far phase. The close phase being, imagine an informal group of people talking, uh, maybe some students talking out in the parking lot together. They're likely to keep four to seven feet between themselves. Um, whereas a formal situation is usually going to fall in the far phase. If I'm giving a lecture to students, it's much more likely that um, I am between seven and 12 feet away, that I keep some space from their desks so I can see everyone, they can all see me. Um, and finally, there is the public distance, which has a close phase, which is generally where we want to keep strangers, and a far phase, um, which is 15 feet or more, where our voices tend to need amplification. We might be speaking into a microphone so everyone can hear us. The last concept of proxemics is territory, um, and this refers to an area that is controlled, maintained, or defended by a group of individuals um, with an emphasis on physical possession. So imagine an office space, that would be a territory um, that only employees of that business would be permitted into, or perhaps clients of that business as well. Your home is your personal territory, and you are not likely to invite strangers into it, and perhaps even acquaintances, but you likely invite your close friends, relatives, and loved ones. In many of the classes that I teach, they are a little bit smaller sized. Um, so oftentimes students will pick a chair and that will be their seat for the entire semester. Um, if someone else sits in it, they oftentimes ask them to move and they will say, I usually sit here. Um, that doesn't necessarily mean they need to sit there, but this is their territory that they're comfortable in that they usually occupy during that time. Next, we have the seven challenges readings from this week. Um, and that's something that I do recommend you read in full uh, because it's so valuable and it will really help you in your personal life and professional life with your communication. Uh, this week, we're focusing on expressing yourself more clearly and completely. Very often in the healthcare environment, we speak in shorthand, um, whether it's patient vitals, um, saying so-and-so is, you know, and then just reading off uh, the list of vitals, rather than saying, I took vitals on patient so-and-so, the blood pressure is this, the temperature is this, um, or, you know, your two o'clock is here, meaning your client who had an appointment at two o'clock has arrived in the waiting room. This can be very useful to speed up communication when we have so much to communicate to each other, but there are also many situations where we want to be very clear, where we might want to avoid expressing our thoughts in this kind of verbal shorthand. In some situations, the listener might interpret a different meaning entirely than what the speaker intended. They might not understand the significance of what's being said. Or we may accidentally or purposefully leave out important and pertinent information. So if you remember back to, I believe, our first lecture um, with the triangle of meaning, our goal with communication is to allow another person to recreate the same thought that we're having or understand the thought that we are having. And the strategy presented by the Seven Challenges readings really helps facilitate that. The five messages that they use focuses on you communicating your own experiences rather than assuming someone else's. Um, this is a very fundamental difference in communication that you'll likely hear again throughout your education. Uh, we call it using I statements instead of you statements. For example, I feel scared instead of saying you scared me. Um, in the second statement, you scared me, the person you're speaking to might deny that that was their intent, that that was their action. But if you say, I feel scared, they can't deny your feeling and they are more likely to put themselves in your shoes and start to wonder why you are scared. Um, these five messages help you expand on that process to form more complete thoughts. And just while there are the literal I versus you statements, there's also um, implied I versus you statements. If you were to say, I feel scared, uh, 
um, that's describing your own feeling. Whereas if you say, I feel attacked, um, that is also putting a little bit of uh, the origin of that feeling on the other person, where they might then come back and say, well, I didn't mean to attack you or make you feel attacked. Both um, some of the messages and resources in this uh, Seven Chapters workbook and my own knowledge on this subject comes from a fantastic book called Nonviolent Communication by R Marshall Rosenberg, um, which if you're struggling with communication in your own life or you would just like to improve your communication with others, um, if you have people that challenge your communication abilities, maybe family members that test your patience a little bit, um, I strongly recommend reading that book. I would say that's probably the most useful of the books that I've listed in these lectures so far. So let's walk through those five messages. Um, first, you're focusing on a sensory or motor experience, something you're seeing, hearing. And next, you go into your emotions as a result of what you're experiencing. Then you explain that feeling to help the other person understand why that feeling results from those sensations for you. And then after that, you describe what your goal is. What do you want? And why do you want it? So a great example would be, when I saw dishes in the sink, I felt irritated because I want to start cooking dinner right away. And I want to ask you to help me do the dishes right now so the dinner will be ready by the time our guests arrive. Rather than, do the dishes, or you left dirty dishes in the sink, you need to clean them. I'm sure you can see how one of those is much more likely to uh, elicit a polite response from your partner than the other. The next reading in the Seven Challenges workbook, Saying What's in Our Hearts, is also fantastic. Um, and I just want to highlight the difference between therapy and therapeutic communication. Therapy is a process that is done by someone who's licensed to provide it, a therapist, a counselor, whereas therapeutic communication is something that we can all use. Um, when you are listening openly and actively to a fellow student, that's an example of therapeutic communication. Essentially, therapeutic communication is communicating in a way that is intended to help benefit the other person. And the reading cites five specific deep learnings um, that are seen in almost all supportive, empathetic, and therapeutic communication. Um, that is that when you pay attention to someone in a calm and accepting way, you help teach that person to pay attention to their own thoughts in that same way. Uh, when you care for others, you teach them to care for themselves, and you help them feel more like caring about others as well. Uh, the more you have faced and accepted your own feelings, the more you can be supportive for someone who is struggling to face their own. And in forgiving people for making mistakes and having limits, you teach them also to forgive themselves, um, that they can also be more forgiving to others. And finally, by having conversations that include honest sharing and recognition of feelings, you help people understand how to explore other alternatives of action, uh, alternative possibilities. You help someone see that they can have more of these honest and helpful conversations in their own lives. You help them see that they have more power in their own life. The next reading discusses um, what's referred to as peer counseling in the resource. And I'm going to clarify and say that this is not peer counseling. Peer counseling is an inappropriate appropriation of the term counseling. Um, that the term counseling, just like the term therapy, should be reserved for uh, a practice that is given by a licensed professional. What I would like to call this is peer support, which is something that we can all give each other. We can, good, uh, we can give good peer support to our peers by telling them that all life includes conflict and difficult situations. And this is where self-disclosure to show some of your own struggles might be very helpful so they understand that it is okay to struggle. Oftentimes, people avoid expressing or even experiencing their own feelings. And so what you can do is to ask people more about these feelings. Um, sometimes someone doesn't want to work that out in their head, but when they have good peer support, they will start to work that out with their words and they will skip over that overthinking anxiety process and simply get out what's in their heart. You can also encourage someone to use those five statements uh, or the five message statements that we discussed earlier. You can encourage them to use I statements to focus on 
what they have control over rather than you statements or statements about a third party. And finally, you can simply actively listen. Um, show the person that you are listening to what they have to say, that you value what they have to say, and perhaps ask, uh, offer advice, perhaps not. A lot of the times with friends of mine, I will ask them, do you want me to listen or do you want me to give advice? Because sometimes people simply want to get something off their chest, and sometimes they do want another set of eyes for a problem, someone to help them figure out a solution. So finally, we're going to go back to the how to detect cultural differences uh, resource. And the biggest thing with this resource, I think it really closely ties into that quote earlier that you must know yourself to know others. And just with that, you must know your own culture um, before you start to know the culture of others. Because learning the cultures of others requires you to look at your own basic assumptions about the world. Communicating across cultures is not simply a literal translation from one language to another. It, it requires both nonverbal communication and verbal communication differences in our ideas about the world. The reading illustrates this with a wonderful example um, that unfortunately we don't have the active classroom to do, but I uh, did it myself with a couple friends and took a picture so you can see what they're talking about. Um, and the assignment was to take a piece of paper, fold it in half, tear off the bottom right corner, fold it in half again, tear off, I believe, the top right corner, fold it again, tear off the top left corner, fold it again, tear off the bottom left corner. Um, or perhaps it was only three times, but essentially you get the idea. It's following that process, and this is what resulted. Each one of the papers looks different. The outer two look a little bit more similar than either are to the middle. Um, the middle even has a different number of holes than the outer two. Um, and this is illustrating the same way that literal communication, because of our changes in nonverbal and um, verbal communication styles, um, the simple language we translate can turn into a wildly different message. So why does this happen? This happens because our culture is an iceberg. There are visible portions of culture, such as the different foods, the different architectural styles, the different clothing we wear, and this is what's visible. But below that is a much larger invisible portion of culture. Um, and that section is based on our values, um, and then deeper than that, our beliefs. And finally, where those values and beliefs come from are assumptions about the world around us. Do you assume the world to be a fundamentally fair place versus fundamentally unfair place? A fundamentally safe place versus fundamentally unsafe place? Those will then lead you to different beliefs about the world, and finally, you will place different value on different principles, different values, um, because living in an unsafe world requires different values than living in a safe world. So I'll bring up one of my favorite uh, cultural comparisons, California versus New York. There are definitely visible differences in culture. Um, there's transportation. You know, New York relies much more heavily on public transportation and their subway system, while California has a sprawling set of freeways. Uh, there is a lot more density, especially on the island of Manhattan. Um, growth was constrained there, so they started to build up whereas the Los Angeles Basin is massive, so we built out before we started to build up. New York even has the nickname of the city that never sleeps, whereas if you go to downtown LA at 10 at night, it's pretty much a ghost town. But underneath that visible section of culture is an invisible section of culture. Um, what are their values? In New York, there tends to be of, uh, often what we call a crab mentality, which is where if somebody's trying to lift themselves up, a lot of people around them are going to be trying to drag them back down to what's seen as their rightful place with the rest of them. There's also a much more fatalistic outlook on the world, meaning that you don't have as much control over how your life is going to go or where things are going to go. You just simply need to learn how to accept your place. Compare that to California, which tends to have much more industrious attitudes. Uh, there's a reason Silicon Valley, the innovation capital of America, is in California. In California, um, it's much less common outside of very specific cultures to see people living in intergenerational homes. Generally, 
once a child reaches 18 or their early 20s, their parents want to push them out of the nest. They should go find a home of their own. Whereas in New York, um, because of the population density and because of the high rent prices, high housing prices, it is much more common for someone to live in an intergenerational home. Um, I had many friends in their late 20s who were still living with their parents and had no goal to leave. Um, and that was because that was their place in the family. It wasn't a burden for them to be living at home. In New York, you see a much more conservative form of liberalism. They're both liberal states, but California has a more libertarian liberalism. Um, New York's liberalism is really focused on the power of government to exert control to create a more equal society, whereas California has a bit more of a uh, push on the role of the individual to lift themselves up with the help of public services. A great movie comparison, yes, one more, um, would be In the Heights, a movie that came out last year about Washington Heights, New York, and um, families uh, and focusing on a young girl who was trying to leave to go, for col uh, go to college and find a better life to her, uh, for herself. She felt this tie to her roots back home, but she also felt this drive to better her own life. Um, and contrast that with the movie Accepted, um, which was filmed in Chapman in Orange County. And the entire focus of that movie is a student who did not get into college trying to simply convince his parents that he did. Um, for the purpose of them feeling like their son was a successful student and was moving forward with his life. The reading has several quotes about Americans, and all of these quotes not only show you something about American culture, but they show you something about the speaker's culture as well. For example, someone from India says that Americans are in a perpetual hurry. Just watch the way they walk down the street. They never allow themselves to enjoy life. There are too many things to do. Um, that's not only coloring American life as hurried, but also Indian life as a little bit more of a focus on enjoying your time. Um, a visitor from Indonesia said everything in the U.S. has to be talked about and analyzed. Even the littlest thing has to be why, why, why? Um, and this is showing that we overanalyze, and in comparison, they analyze less. A uh, visitor from Ethiopia talks about how Americans are explicit. We want a yes or a no. We don't like it when someone speaks figuratively. Um, and that tells you that their culture allows and probably encourages speaking in a more indirect and figurative manner. Someone from Colombia comments on so many young people living alone. Um, just like I spoke about with those intergenerational homes. Um, that Colombian said the United States must be the loneliest country in the world. Um, and that's showing the different values that they have versus Americans. A visitor from the Netherlands commented on the size of our eggs. We don't have small eggs. We have medium, large, extra large, and jumbo, um, often like our drink sizes. And this is showing that they don't have that same supersize me mentality that we do. Again, this is that same idea I was talking about before of our own lens of bias and perception, um, our own assumptions about the world, that stepping outside of the matrix to look at different perspectives. Now, our values are not black and white. They're not explicit like that Ethiopian was talking about of we have them or we don't. All of our values lie on a continuum. Um, on the top here, we have individual uh, emphasis placed on the individual versus emphasis placed on the collective. Generally, Eastern nations place more of a value on collectivism, while Western nations place more of a value on individualism. Um, you, the U.S. is very individualistic, whereas the U.K. tends to have a little bit more of a uh, group mentality or a what's best for the whole. Um, Latin America tends to fall a little bit more in the middle in between those. Um, we have next down egalitarian or equal societies versus hierarchical societies. Um, Norway is a great example and the U.S. is a little bit over. And, um, that's something that you see more commonly, especially in the Scandinavian countries, in um, countries that are very homogenous with only one race, it's e easy for them to have no problems with relations between different groups because it's all one group. 
um, while we might have a focus on egalitarian values, um, we still are burdened by our past actions in the ways that we have related with other races in America. Um, the Romance languages tend to fall a little bit more in the middle. Um, gendering in the Romance languages often splits the view of the world into more masculine, more feminine. And that's moving more towards a hierarchical value, like you might see in India or Indonesia. Um, finally, we have direct versus indirect communication. Direct communication, like Dutch and German, um, they tend to be very to the point. And this is something that is common for synthetic languages. These are languages that, in order to create meaning, um, they combine words together. They combine portions of words into very large words. Um, whereas analytic languages use multiple words and their order in the sentence to create meaning and describe other words. Um, so the U.S. is a little bit further down the continuum than German, um, and the Romance languages are a little bit further down the continuum still. Uh, finally, on the very indirect side, we have Japanese and Chinese. Um, Chinese is a complex analytic language, whereas Japanese is an agglutinative synthetic language. And as much as I'd love to dive into more details, this is not a linguistics class, so we'll move on to our final uh, discussion of a little bit more detail in the direct or indirect communication style. Um, you have the direct style on top where you can see it moves in a linear fashion from one side to the other, whereas in indirect style, you have a couple of detours along the way. Maybe you go back and reference something else that you were discussing before and expand on that thought in order to give the details that you want. There we go. There's the slide. Sorry about that. Um, so this is a visual description of those two different communication styles. So just as I mentioned before, these ways that we communicate reflect our basic assumptions and our values about the world. Um, the resource presents some wonderful questions that help illustrate these differences. For example, is the basic unit in society the individual or is it the collective? Um, is obligation a benefit or a burden? Do we value age um, or do we value youth? Are genders equal or unequal? And are gendered activities negotiable or are they restricted to their specific genders? In terms of social organization, um, is membership in a group temporary or permanent? Can you change your stars? Um, is form important or is it distrusted? Are personal activities something that should be private, or are they all public? Do we approach social organization in a horizontal, egalitarian manner, or in a hierarchical manner? And finally, is the approach to authority direct or mediated? Can the state exert direct authority over us, or does it need to be mediated through cultural and social institutions? When you ask these questions about different societies, you'll see that they can have vast differences in the way that they approach the basic questions of life. Um, so that concludes our third lecture today um, on communication and healthcare. Thank you so much for watching, and I will see you in the next lecture.